Alrighty, so I think we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Greetings, everyone. It's so good to have you join us this afternoon for this very special 7C in Claremont community event, kicking off our 2021 reunion celebration here at Pitzer. My name is Brandon Kyle. I am the Director of Alumni and Family Engagement, and we are thrilled to have you with us to celebrate over 50 years of two of our longest standing consortium organizations that have been leading the charge in student support, advocacy, and activism for decades. I am honored to start our program with our first session entitled Embracing Our Activist Past and Exploring Our Present, OBSA and CLSA celebrating over 50 years of building community. With that said, I will turn it over to one of our moderators for this afternoon, Lydia Middleton, Dean and Director of the Office of Black Student Affairs, who will give an overview of tonight's presentation and introduce our panelists. Thank you, Lydia. Good evening or late afternoon, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and I appreciate uh, this opportunity from Pittsburgh College to be able to speak to um, the events and um, support and activism leading up to the founding of the Office of Black Student Affairs, uh, the Office of Chicano Latino Student Affairs, um, Intercollegiate Department of Africana Studies and Intercollegiate Department of Chicanx Latinx Studies. Um, so I, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my co-panelists and colleagues um, who will be on uh, this presentation alongside me. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Soshi Casillas, the Interim Dean of Students for Chicano Latino Student Affairs, Supaya Portillo, Associate Professor of Chicana Chicano, Latina, Latino, Transnational Studies of Pitzer College and the Intercollegiate Department of Chicano Latina Studies. And Marian Solomon, Assistant Professor of Africana Studies, Intercollegiate Department of Africana Studies and Department of History at Scripps College. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Soshi, who's gonna talk a little bit about, more about um, what our goals for today are and we'll jump right into the session. Great. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, as many of you know, due to COVID, we had to cancel our in-person alumni reception, which would have celebrated our 50th year last year. Um, however, today we are, you know, charging forward and wanted to celebrate all of the activism that has led to the creation of our cultural centers and academic departments. Um, as Brandon mentioned, we uh, began in 1969. That is over 50 years ago. We are the oldest, one of the oldest across the nation. While many institutions have diversity offices and multicultural houses, um, we are very fortunate in that we have our departments, um, our respective houses. So not only do the um, Office of Black Student Affairs and Chicano Latino Student Affairs come together to celebrate our culture and heritage, but we come together when we meet challenges. Um, that has been particularly important in the last five years under the Trump administration, which has identified our population as um, criminals. And there's been um, a great political uprising for both the black and brown communities. Um, student activism is alive and well. And today we are you know, just so proud of our students who continue to show their political interest, their engagement to ensure that our culture and academic, academic centers still stand. Um, without further ado, we are going to have Professor Solomon speak about student projects, the research of historical archives and information on the stories um, that our students are doing here at the Claremont Colleges. Thank you. Hi all, it's great to be with you. So I began here at the Claremont Colleges about five years ago and this project of uncovering the history of my department, Africana Studies, started then. I was just curious about my new intellectual home. And the first summer after my first year, I decided to do some research on our founding, which I knew was in 1969. And having studied ethnic studies in general since I was an undergraduate, I knew that that was an early date. So San Francisco State, the very first um, black studies program through the uh, student strike was established that same year. So the Claremont colleges were not far behind, um, but actually the same year as San Francisco State. 
So being at a liberal arts college, I decided to integrate students into the research. Um, so I had a few volunteers that had come to me asking, you know, professor, can we do some research with you this summer? And one was a Pitzer student, two from Pomona College, and one from Scripps College. And we just poured over archival materials that summer, um, and we conducted oral history interviews with some of the um, students and professors in Africana studies that had been around earlier. So um, what we found um, really enthralled and inspired us. And um, right now, when you see me here as a representative of the Intercollegiate Department of Africana Studies, and then Dean Middleton as um, the representative of OBSA, those two forces were one thing at their founding called um, the Black Studies Center. And this does tell um, some of the story that we uncovered, um, which was there was this more holistic approach um, to see the student experience as different than who the colleges were originally designed for and had served for decades and decades. So there were a few um, Black students at the Claremont Colleges um, before 1965, but it really started to pick up in those years um, between 65 and 69 exponentially um, as it was picking up in colleges across the nation. It was really reflective of the social struggle of the late 1960s. Um, and, you know, the institutions were doing a bit more to recruit folks to come to the universities. And it was a bit of a different student, whereas those early um, Black students before 1965, a lot of them were middle class, um, had been educated possibly in um, white high schools. A uh, new set of students were um, registering across the nation that were from working class neighborhoods. And it was through their um, vocalization across the nation uh, about having, um, you know, needs beyond what was being done, which was just admitting them and maybe um, sometimes it, uh, offering pre-freshman programs. But even those were undercut at various times so that the students had to protest to keep them. These programs are for students who perhaps didn't get all the um, college training that private schools sometimes offer um, and just needed some prep before they started. So this was something um, that students wanted in 1969. They also just wanted to see themselves represented, represented in the curriculum and in the faculty. So they wanted more Black faculty, more classes relevant to their life experiences. And the thing that amazed me the most was that the creation of the Black Studies Center happened because of these students. They were just undergraduates. These are not even graduate students. They were trying to earn their BA while creating a Black Studies Center. That's just so amazing to me. So they created two sets of demands, um, both of them really thoughtful. Uh, I'll show you um, some of these archival documents that uh, I've been looking at with students. Okay, so just for example, one of these documents says um, the BSU of the Claremont Colleges was created to meet the needs and express the desires of the Black students at these colleges. Although it has become cliche, it is still necessary to state that present faculty and staff, with very few exceptions, are equipped to evaluate our performance and situation only from a white middle class orientation, however liberal and humanitarian they may be. Let it be understood that we did not come here merely to study academically, 
but to also bring back to our respective communities methods of alleviating the problems that now exist. So that's really key to their vision. And when we're saying we want to look back at 50 years, um, not just at the Claremont colleges, but across the nation at the um, founding of Black Studies and other ethnic studies departments, we're really talking about that sentiment in that last sentence that I read, which is, um, the students were not interested in knowledge for knowledge's sake, which is the ethos of the college and the university system since the 19th century, uh, push to not have any bias in one's research, that you could be uh, wholly objective, and that's how you um, both, you know, receive tenure and um, become a great student while you're in college. Um, those metrics were not working for those students, those new working class black students attending the Claremont colleges. They instead saw this, their success as being tied to being able to do something for the communities they came from and the neighboring communities around Claremont. And so it was like speaking two different languages and I think that still exists today. Um, where you know the metrics are a bit different for working class students of color and what they want to see out of their education and, and what they want to see um, be the benefits for their community. So um, in knowing these origins, um, we looked in particular at some of the specific things that they did as part of their degree and the outreach that they've been that they did um, with their community and we are now as um, students and faculty in Africana studies trying to take a note from this period and bring back some of the things that existed um, just to name um, I guess a few things that holistic point of view um, about black students experiences that it's not really separate um mental health issues from um you know your academic studies they're really a part of this experience of attending a predominantly white institution and needing that very, very specific kind of support um to things like the africana studies department when it existed in its first form as the black studies center did offer um, Swahili, for example, an African language, and now that is not within the umbrella of the department, the intercollegiate department of Africana studies, but something that is sometimes offered at Pomona, sometimes not, it's a half credit, and it was so central to students and their vision of this curriculum at the beginning that there be an African language offered by the Black Studies Department, and we are the continuers of that with Africana Studies being um, a diasporic framework to uh, add to the original liberatory um, essence of Black Studies. At no point in any of these decades did um, Black Studies scholars say that we've now abandoned this original premise of a liberatory type of research and work, but rather it just fell out through a, a variety um, of reasons and pushes and pulls that relate to institutions of power, who they favor, who's granted money, who's granted space. Um, so I would say that the panelists here today really represent the spirit and ethos of the original ethnic studies department. And it's such a pleasure to be here with them on the same panel. I will cut my um, remarks there. There's, of course, so much more I can say after having done this research for four years and still going. Um, I'll just say that coming out of it, students have produced posters um, that they've shared with their college, um, you know, uh, presentations. We've gone to conferences together that are celebrating 50 years of Black studies, and um, we're presently working on an article. So at some point, you will be able to read more about this kind of history, and we'll try very hard, especially through OBSA, to um, put that article in your hands. But if you want to learn more about the founding of Black Studies, you can contact me, Marianne Solomon, get my email from Scripps College website, or you can watch the documentary 
Agents of Change, which provides a full context for the founding of Black Studies across the nation by first telling the story of San Francisco State and then moving to some other institutions. So thank you. Oh, my colleague, Professor Portillo. Thank you so much, uh, Marianne Solomon, for that presentation. Obviously, we have so many shared interests um, in Chicanx Latinx studies. Um, so my name is Suyapa Portillo Villeda, and I'm in um, both the field group of Chicano Latino Transnational Studies at Pitzer, but also a uh, member of the Intercollegiate Department of Chicano Latino Studies. Um, at the uh, five, seven C level, right? I'm, I prepared some uh, things in writing and I'm going to go ahead and share a little PowerPoint. So let me know if you can't see it. Um, uh, let me start here and go from here. Um, can you see it, right? Okay. So um, Chicanos, uh, Chicano, Chicana, Latino, Latino studies emerged at the Claremont Colleges in 1969 the direct product of student struggle and educational inclusion of Chican for Chicanos and Latinos at that time. Now we're in our fifth decade. We have the distinction of being the second oldest Chicano, Chicana, Latino studies in the United States. Those decades have witnessed the growth and development of our department, now including eight full-time core faculty serving the student population at five distinct undergraduate colleges. The way it started was that the Claremont Council of Presidents first institutionalized Chicano studies at the Claremont Colleges in 69, deciding upon the designation of an intercollegiate center. Reflective of the desire to create an immediate Latino presence, which at that time was mostly Chicano and Mexican American at all campuses, Chicano studies at the Claremont Colleges began in a politically expedient way. While the designation intercollegiate reflected a stratagem to give each of the colleges ownership right, no formal obligation or mechanism of support accompanied me. Consequently, in early years, the Intercollegiate Center of Chicano Studies struggled to meet the basic staffing needs. Though the Intercollegiate Center of Chicano Studies existed on paper and was touted in college catalogs between 1969 and 1979, there was no tenure track intercollegiate faculty appointment. During the first decade of its existence, Chicano Studies course offerings were provided by two-year visiting appointments who were not contractually affiliated. Most of these two-year appointments were graduate students struggling to finish their dissertation while teaching full-time, and often in a very hostile environment. In the documents that created Chicano Studies in 1969, an option was made available for any of the five Claremont Colleges to institute a tenure-track joint appointment with the Intercollegiate Center. None of the colleges exercised this until 1979, and that is how our professor uh, Ray Buriel gets hired at Pomona College, and um, he's, you don't see him in this slide because um, he's passed away, but um, he's one of the first professors to get hired. Um, and then came a few other hires. So in the decades since this loose system of support grew, whereby all the colleges can claim as their own Chicano studies, to varying degrees, um, and I lost my place, I'm so sorry, um, to varying degrees. Um, <clears throat> and in reality, we um, have faculty, um, as you can see here, from um, really Pomona, Scripps, and Pitzer. So we're really sort of not covered in, in Harvey Mudd or um, CMC, right? Um, the dynamic of Chicano Latino studies uh, prompted a formal change in our department in 2007 um, because it used to be called Chicano Studies. So the Chicano Studies Center, very similar to OBSA, became, um, in, became the intercollegiate department and was kind of split into in the 70s. And then um, and then 2007, uh, we added Chicano Latinx studies. I like to tell that story because um, most of our departments don't uh, come because um, every like the university was enlightened to uh, create our programs, right? They come from struggle. They come from people who felt marginalized in the university, very similar to the students, um, you know, the African-American students who started um, Black studies here, right? They felt marginalized. They felt like their topics are not being taught. And, you know, I was, I'm also a Pitzer alumni from class of 1996. And I could tell you, like, definitely that was an issue, right? Um, not having representation, even in the 90s. 
um, the, the first professor, uh, Chicano Latino professor that I remember coming in the 90s was Jose Calderon, who since has retired and, and um, since I've come here, right? And then um, it's interesting, right? Because, you know, this is struggle. So one of the things I wanna talk about is how we center this in our own um, university and in our, in our own program. Um, we really value um, activism and the organizing that students do. We don't feel threatened by it in any way. We definitely welcome it and we're always uh, impressed when students come to us with, you know, our, our, our response to student activism and, and protest is never like, let's stop it. Let's just make it. No, we want to have the dialogue. We want to have the discussion, but that's because that's our foundational ethos, right? Like this is where we come from. And so we want to hear from, you know, people. Um, and so one thing I wanted to, uh, you know, check, uh, kind of uh, talk about was, you know, when I was a student here and, and uh, is that um, even though I wasn't a Chicano Latino studies major at the time, I felt like the Intercollegiate Department of Chicano Latino Studies and CLSA, which will be discussed a little later, were homes. That's where we spent, for example, um, you know, moments talking to our professors about the different movements. For example, when I was here, we were discussing Proposition 187, which was going to curtail all kinds of benefits for immigrants. And it was in Chicano Studies that I met um, Javier, uh, uh, the the professor, the um, grad student who eventually got me involved in the community, right? Um, Dia de los Muertos was this important moment where um, staff and faculty got to share with students and then things emerged from their plans emerge, organizing moments. Um, so one of those moments was the takeover of Alexander Hall in 1996, of which I was one student of many that took part in it. And Alexander Hall at Pomona College had just been built. It was brand new and um, African-American students uh, Latinx students and Asian American students, we used to meet in the media living room, which doesn't exist anymore at Pitzer, but it's it used to be where communications office is. And we would meet there and kind of talk about what was going on. And what was going on is that we were not seeing um, African American professors uh, being tenured. Uh, we were seeing the denial of tenure to Latinx professors. And then there was no Asian American studies department at all. So the nature of the organizing with for ethnic studies is that we all collaborated at least in that period and even now in trying to make changes in the university. So uh, many of us were from Pitzer and then we got to Alexander Hall at five in the morning and climbed the walls um and basically took over for an entire week and this is right at the same around the time that ucla students were doing a hunger strike to establish chicano studies which was established in 1996-97 at ucla can you imagine how late that was right and we had already had all this experience so um I remember that those takeovers in the 90s, right, were really important and, and really inspired by the Black Panthers and the Chicano movement, right? Because that's who we're reading, you know? And, um, and that out of that emerged um, this ethos of collaboration with the Ethnic Studies Department, but also um, a sort of um, unapologetic militancy. And, you know, oftentimes people would say things like, um, you know, if you are an activist, you're never gonna graduate and and like go to grad school because, you know, like it'll make you look bad. And I have to say some of the most um, respectable mentors and trainers and professors I've ever had in my life um, respected my activism, but also made me write the papers. And maybe they gave me one extension or two, but they made me who I am now. And I wouldn't be, you know, um, I wouldn't be a, a PhD if it wasn't for that level of engagement that, that I got there. So, um, you know, activism is at the heart and struggle of what we do, uh, respecting the organizing struggles of people, accompanying people, right? Um, and we don't speak for people, we accompany those people in our community. Um, and so I think that that's kind of at the heart of, you know, what racial justice and gender and sexuality justice is for us. And so I'm gonna leave here the, our website, which we're really excited, it's a brand new website. It has all of our requirements. So you could see the diversity of things we teach uh, from transborder studies to, you know, everything, the border, uh, Chicano history, methodology. Um, and then, you know, if it's easier, you can also just email me. Thank you for, for this opportunity.
Um, thank you so much, Siapa and Marianne, for um, providing those perspectives. Um, what I really appreciated about each of your presentations was uh, the different take on your experiences with um, either being part of the activist history or supporting students in exploring and discovering um, what the roles of some of these students were in establishing um, the centers and where we are today. Um, I always, I, I actually recently learned a lot of this history in the past couple of years as we were starting to celebrate our 50th anniversary. I really had no idea about a lot of these very important historical milestones, um, including the bombing that occurred on campus that was pinned on um, students of African descent and how they had to be actually hidden in um, a, it was a faculty member's home um, because of the threats that they were receiving from pretty much militarized members of the general public and campus. So um, with those things in mind and thinking about where we are today in terms of um, reactions and responses to white supremacy culture, police brutality, and the impacts that this has had on our students um, as they process these things and try to figure out their place in um, fights for justice, in articulating their needs to um, campus leadership and to their peers. Um, we definitely see a lot of connections in um, some of the needs that were expressed then in 1969 and in the 90s, which we're, you know, we're aghast that, oh, how could, the, how could things be so backwards in that time? But they really were. I mean, I was in college at that time too. And some of the things that I remember actually being allowed to be said in class or, um, you know, we call the microaggressions today, but back then it just felt like just aggressions um, and the constant struggle for students of color to find um, spaces where their identities are affirmed, where they felt safe, where they could um, thrive and grow. Um, those didn't really exist um, for, for far too long. So one of the things that um, OBSA and CLSA and uh, academic departments like IBCLS and IDAS are committed to is helping amplify student voices, whether it's through their scholarship and academic work or through their inter, um, interpersonal relationships and um, through partnering with us on projects. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more in the next couple of minutes about the ways that um, OBSA and CLSA especially work with student activists since um, we're thinking about our activist past and how students were such an instrumental part of that. Um, we still see a lot of these movements happening on campus, whether they're responding to um, global issues and concerns or um, things that they have identified as important and um, worth speaking up about that happen on campus, um, from you know, faculty representation of people of color to um, classroom um, climate and to just resources that are needed for students of African descent, students of Chicanx, Latinx descent, um, Asian students and queer students. So um, pretty much all the students that are at the margins who have um, uh, are, are the most impacted by injustice. Um, people always associate them with activism because they've had to have the loudest voices. Um, but as we can see from some of the historical artifacts, um, a lot of the strength came from um, unifying across cultural differences, across race, um, across gender, so that these voices could be amplified even louder. Um, and we like to help remind students that um, allies can come from anywhere. So you don't have to only look within your um, ethnic group, your um, affiliation um, to, to find support and to find strength. So even though OBSA serve, serves as a place where we um, really are conscious in our efforts to support students and like the fact that they have a mirror to see people that look like them that have a similar cultural experience um, supporting them and in their growth. Um, we also try to help them reach out um, cross-culturally. So we've done quite a bit of partnering and work with um, CLSA and IDCLS um, in addition to IDAS so that students are aware of what's here and what's on campus. Um, and we have um, been happy with the fact that um, a lot of these connections are being um, more, but brought to light even more. And that students are asking for them, particularly students who have multiple identities, 
um, students who don't feel like, you know, there's one identity that, um, that describes them and that encompasses their experience. Um, so a lot of what we try to do is encourage students to explore who they are. Um, and some of that is through activism. And some of that is through, you know, just existing and trying to um, make it to get their degrees. So we definitely prioritize their academic success. We, we know why they're here. Um, but part of their growth and development also um, has an interpersonal aspect. And um, some of those interpersonal um, relationships lead them to become more involved in some of these movements. So some of the things that we provide through OBSA, um, and especially, and we're very careful in navigating this because one, we don't want to impose our own views on students and tell them how to experience campus or um, how to be an activist. Um, but we do offer space and support for them to think critically about what, what it is they hope to accomplish if they are participating, um, who might help guide them, and um, creating a path and really helping them see that you know, maybe protesting is part of what they envision themselves having to do to get to the goal that they're, they're looking for. Um, but really thinking of it on a spectrum where, yes, that's, that, that could be part of it, but, you know, what happens after the protests are over? So do you want to continue to have dialogue? Um, do you want to be part of some of the leadership teams or communicate with some of the people that are decision makers and hold them accountable? Um, or do you want to, you know, simply get your peers together, make, um, make as much noise as possible so that you can have an audience um, and then walk away. So we encourage them to not walk away <laughs> if that's um, something that they're interested in. And the other thing we want to encourage them to do, and, and so she's going to talk more about this as well, is to evaluate whether they have the capacity to participate in these ways, um, especially if they have goals that involve, um, you know, completing their coursework, um, working, um, providing for their families, and um, other, other things that require them to have balance. So um, we really encourage them, like if they do consider themselves a leader who participates in activism, to think about, you know, how are your peers supporting you? So if you're saying you are fighting on behalf of your peers, are they also with you helping um, to shoulder some of the responsibility in making sure that these things happen? Um, so some of those are just a few of the critical questions that we ask activists and we definitely like to assist them with creating a plan. So if they're saying, you know, we, this is the thing that we want to see happen, then we say, well, what, what are the steps that's, what's it going to take for these things to happen and how much time will it take and who would be responsible? Um, do you want us to help you think about, you know, what that plan would look like? So, you know, we're not pushing them out to do, to perform in one way or another. But we want to help them be critical and thoughtful members of the community. Um, and, and that, again, is part of our past as a, as a department that was founded by student um, activism and student leadership in those ways. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Soshi, who's going to talk a little bit more about how we handle, how, how we assist students in handling some of the emotional impact of activism to help them stay focused. Yes, thank you, Lydia. Um, I always like to kind of put it into context in terms of the Latinx uh, student community. Each year, our incoming class is 250 students. That's 250 students that apply and mark that they're, they identify as Latinx. That's about 50 students at each of the, the colleges. So um, when we talk about some of the impacts that means for underrepresented students, um, particularly Latinx students, um, they're oftentimes the only Latinx student in the classroom. Um, anecdotally, they'll say, I feel like I'm the spokesperson for all things that uh, represent the diaspora. Um, oftentimes, students will say they think I'm Mexican. Everything's Mexi Mexico or Mexican here in LA, but I'm actually Puerto Rican or Cuban. And so um, there's a lot of issues that students come in, as, largely um, as first year students. Uh, for many, they're getting involved with um, the Intercollegiate Department of Chicano Latino Studies, and they're learning about their histories. They're ignited. Um, they're learning about you know, how they can get involved um, in terms of looking at disproportionate numbers of Latinx students in higher ed or incarceration rates. Um, the pandemic has largely affected our communities. So there's many issues that our students um, in terms of mental health, uh, they're dealing with. And so um, when we talk about kind of the way that our centers and departments are supporting our students, 
we're always looking at supporting their mental health. Um, unfortunately, black and brown students don't access um, therapy and that's really important for uh, balancing their activism and being successful in college. Um, what we have done this year is we've really focused on mental health. Um, and we've had to change the language. Uh, we've partnered with two Latinx therapists at Mansoor uh, Counseling and Psychological Services, Dr. Dana Reyes and Dr. Lisette Sanchez. Um, they're taking on a culturally sensitive and culturally responsive approach to mental health. Um, so we ask our students, you know, it sounds like you're really stressed, you're, you seem anxious, you're not eating, you're not sleeping. Um, and they're, they'll say, well, look, you know, I'm, I'm undocumented. I'm from a mixed status family. Families are being, you know, deported. Families are being, um, you know, separated. And so, um, or they might say, I'm first gen, I'm low income. Um, I'm LGBT, I'm exploring all of these things. And now I'm involved in social movements. You know, I'm going to protest, I'm, I'm doing petitions. And so they're, they're becoming active. They're critical thinkers, they're becoming independent. And so we're often um, advising them to go to seek mental health, um, our professionals. And they'll say no, because um, I told my family that I would see a therapist. And this is like the cultural nuances of um, Latinos not accessing mental health, but they think that I'm crazy. Or my, my um, I told my mom that I'm, I'm going to my first therapy uh, session and they'll say, you know, don't tell your Theo or Thea, like don't tell anybody in your family, they're gonna think you're crazy. And it's just like the conversations that students have to have um, when they're navigating what it looks like to access mental health. And so um, we're changing the language. If you look at our newsletters, if you look at um, kind of our flyers, we call it, um, wellness workshop, so we don't say mental health. Um, uh, those, we have drop-in sessions instead of one-on-one -on -one counseling um, with Dr. Dana Reyes. Dr. Lisette Sanchez, she hosts um, group therapy, but we call it healing circles. So this is the way that we are looking at how we're supporting our students um, because our students are changes that change. Uh, Siapa, you mentioned the name of the documentary. I mean, these are our students, they're um, on the front lines on Saturdays, they're in downtown LA, you know, they're supporting uh, a lot of these issues. At the same time, they're students at one of the most prestigious institutions in the nation. So we are often, you know, having conversations with our students and we know that they're very passionate and they're very committed to some of these causes, but we have to remind them that they're students and um, if they're going to be, you know, activists that they take care of them, themselves first and foremost. Um, and so I think that, yeah, for us, we, we talk to our, our males, our students who identify as males and, and the whole machismo and male masculinity and, and not having to, um, I, I can tell you like, if I talk to 20 uh, Latinx males, I think only one has access to mental health. So we have a lot, you know, we have a, a long ways to go, but I will say over the past two years, um, when we first started this new initiative, we only had two or three students sign up. Um, but in this past year, we've had a, a, you know, a healing circle of 15 to 25 students. So we know that we're, we're moving the needle and, and within one year just by changing the language um, and type, tapping into our partners at Monsoor who self-identify as Latinx and they're able to connect um, and share their identity and, and use what we need, which is this cultural sensitive and cultural responsive um, approach to healing. Um, there's a lot of trauma that our students are dealing with and so um, I think, you know, we're just trying to wrap up this, what does it look like to be in solidarity? What does it look like to continue, um, you know, being activists? But right now we're really looking at healing um, to make sure that students take pause and take care of themselves. Um, they're fully equipped, but uh, I think that's just our, our, our most important um, piece of the, this entire puzzle is this healing aspect. And I think all of our offices are doing such a tremendous job um, to support our students. And um, I think that's where we're at today is we're, we're just trying to rebuild and have a more humane society, um, especially at the Claremont Colleges, we're doing what we can. So we appreciate, we appreciate um, you know, everyone that's here today, um, 50 years and we're still very much committed to our students and the cause. So um, with that said, we, we are going to have a few minutes to um, allow for folks to have um, an opportunity for Q&A. There is a Q&A box and I, I don't think there are any questions right now, but if there are any questions for the panelists, um, please feel free to drop it in the chat or in the Q&A. 
And, and just to add a little bit, um, you know, this this uh, past summer 2020, um, during the um, protests for um, the movement for Black Lives, and many of our students were out there. In fact, sometimes even called us because, you know, LAPD was rounding people up. And they know that because of our community engagement, we know attorneys, you know, and right away, like, you know, our chair, Jill Belcho and I got on the phone and you know, contacted attorneys and, and turns out that, you know, they eventually let all of the protesters go. But, you know, in other cases, it was a little scary. So, I mean, I think that we we can't be afraid of protests, you know, protest is an important part of how we came about. There was, you know, this wasn't given to us. We had to organize for it. Um, but yes, re reminding them what their rights are and, and knowing that they have a safe sort of connection to us, right? That we can call, you know, Victor Narro, right? Um, that we can call other attorneys that have been successful um, is really important. Um, and I just, you know, having those communications, like, I mean, I'm gonna be really honest with you. Most of my students have my cell phone. And like, when I tell that to professors that are not African-American or Latinx or Asian-American, they're like, what? Like you give your students your, most of my students have our cell phones, right? And, you know, Marianne and I accompanied students after the pandemic uh, who were stranded at Pomona and were, were being evicted. And, you know, they, 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 we pick them up, we give them our cell phone. You know, I think, uh, Marianne, I don't know if you want to chat about that. Like, you know, they stayed at your home, like, you know, they come eat with us, um, you know, when they don't have somewhere to go for Thanksgiving. Like, we are not just educators that don't have a history in a community. You know, we're really engaged in multiple ways in the, in to benefit our students. And I think that that's hard to understand in a neoliberal university context, right? Like, what is this? And, you know, that's not my formation. That's not where I came from. Um, and so those are the ways that that resistance kind of occurs in, in these small ways, you know? Yeah, thank you, Siapa. Yeah, I think um, many, many students appreciate all the work that you do, and, and they speak highly of you also. Um, we know that, you know, that's out of your scope, and you continue to support them. So we appreciate you both. Um, there is a question in the chat. And uh, the first one was, how can alumni support your respective offices or departments? I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so for us, we've really um, been fortunate in having a really strong um, connection with some of our alumni who um, really wanna connect with students and wanna know what OBSA is doing and how to get involved. So um, we thought it would be a great idea to um, keep them um, engaged and connected to us by creating kind of an informal alumni association um, of, of Black alums. Um, and that's actually led us to do uh, quite a few things that we felt were, were mutually beneficial to our community. So um, one is a mentoring program with alumni and students that has been running for about three years. Um, so alumni can sign up. Um, once they sign up, we really put them in our database and kind of like mine that for different reasons. Um, but the main part is that, you know, they can self-select to be part of our mentoring group. But once they're involved with us, um, we can bother them for, um, uh, for our Black graduation where we invite um, an alumni from each of the schools. Like we've been rotating actually this year, we have a Scripps alumni who graduated in 2013, who's gonna be our speaker. Um, and this is all because you know they agreed to do a survey for us. They tell us a little bit about their um, their current careers and where they are, and um, we ask them if it's okay to ask them um, to, to participate as a potential keynote. So we really use that database quite a bit to find and identify alums. Um, and one of the things we're really happy about is connecting with um, alums who are a little bit more recent. Um, because we notice that their messages to students, um, especially if they're not that far out from the undergraduate or graduate experience, um, is, is a little bit more connective and um, the students really respond well to seeing folks that, you know, graduated in the last 10 or 15 years um, and what, and what they've, they've been doing and how they've experienced campus. So I think students feel like, oh, you know, life is going to be so much different once I graduate. 
you know, I won't have issues with this. And, it, and a lot of them are saying, well, actually, you know, the workforce is its own different animal. <laughs> and a lot of the things that you're experiencing kind of prepare you for what the world is, is like um, in, in a professional setting. Um, so we could really use more alumni in our database who might be interested in mentoring current students. Um, and we also hold events throughout the year, like we did a few events before uh, the campus shutdown where we invited alums to um, networking socials and um, connections with current faculty and staff and recently graduate students as well as graduate students. So, you know, different ways that we can put different part, different members of our community um, in fellowship with one another is something that we're really committed to. Um, and then we also hold this event and so she referenced this where we have a um, open house or alumni gathering during alumni weekend for each of the seven colleges. So even if it's not your weekend for alumni weekend, the events that we hold are always 7C inclusive. Um, and that's a way for alums to come and just look around OVSA, reminisce a little bit. Uh, we can talk to them about being involved, but like, you know, having these kind of joyful and um, happy interactions with our staff and with other students is, is really encouraging to us. And I think um, the alums get something out of it too. So we love to connect more and because we, we don't, it's not that we, we don't always get all the information from each of the colleges um, in terms of the demographics. So we kind of have to look that up for ourselves. I put my response there, but it's very similar to OBSA, um, career development and pathways. OBSA and CLSA works very closely in that a lot of our alumni, whether they're doctors, lawyers, they're working for, you know, uh, corporations. Um, we often have alumni who, who talk about like this hidden curriculum of like, what does the interview look like? You know, what are they, you know, what does the interview process um, entail? And so we're really getting some insight from, from our alumni who are allowing our students to not only network, but learn about, you know, the culture and whether it's a good fit. So we, we that's been um, one of, you know, one of the most um, important alumni support that we've received, but mentorship is definitely important. And, and if you're a good cook or you wanna celebrate and share your heritage and culture, please, we would love for you to host a workshop um, just so you can get to know our current students. I think just know that, you know, obviously CLSA, OBSA, our houses are always open to you all. And, and you know, we encourage you to connect with us as well as the academic offices. I don't know on the faculty, and I don't know, Marianne, if you want to speak, but um, I, I don't know. I, I think when we went to the Zoom, just to answer the question on Zoom, how we support our students, you know, um, I held virtual classes almost every single day. I think I only had three asynchronous classes. And part of the reason I did that is because for many students, that was a piece of sanity. I know that many students were upset about having to be on Zoom. But for our Latinx um, and, and students of color, they were essential workers, their families were essential workers. You know, they had like children that, that were in the house, like they were, you know, they were sitting in the kitchen and their mother was cooking. So there was really no space for them to be a student. And so having to come to my class and, you know, doing engaging things in class, um, I think that that provided some support. And then also I was able to like listen to them and and, when, when it, you know, like this past week is they had to turn in their thesis. So, you know, I said, okay, Thursday, we're, we're going to do something different, you know, because I knew that they were stressed. So um, I think that that was, you know, what I did both semesters and um, because I know that that was important. And then the other thing, like I said, is just being in communication, right? If, if people are not coming in, uh, being able to, to check in on them and, um, and provide flexibility. Uh, flexibility in grading and in reading assignments, which is really hard. I'm a historian, you know? Like I like to assign reading. Like we're gonna read books in my class. And so that was hard for me to negotiate, but, um, but we did that because I knew that many of our students were, were deeply struggling. So um, the other thing is we also continued our community projects. Um, 
by um, doing interviews through Zoom um, because our students had access to Zoom so we can connect with community members who were connected via Zoom. So in the fall, we interviewed temporary protected status leaders um, in LA and other parts. Like they can connect with anyone throughout the nation, right? Because it's all over Zoom. And then this year we're doing Central American women leaders. Um, and so I think that those kinds of assignments um, also were supported, right? Because it wasn't your typical research paper, but you're still learning, you're still um, evaluating. So those are the kinds of things that we did. And this is what we talk about in our department all the time, um, how to be flexible, but rigorous uh, in the pandemic and you know what this means for our students. So just to answer that question. Um, so, Students in Africana studies are often involved in activist work on campus. And, you know, just like the students in 1968, 69, I mean, who poured tons and tons of time and thought into creating a Black Studies Center. These students are credited for that. And it was about five of them during winter break that created the final document that was the demands and the explanation and the theory behind the demands and the very specifics of who needed to be hired. And what I like about those is that they created student positions because they had realized the value of their own work, even though they hadn't been at all compensated. In fact, they got so much runaround from the administration. I'm just so surprised that they didn't get so frustrated and just stop, right? But instead they carried on and then they, for the next set of students, some of them were seniors when they were doing this work, created paid positions within the Black Studies Center to continue to create these programs. If students are actively improving our institutions, which they often are, even though we have to talk to them about the practicality of it all, I don't see how they don't get any monetary compensation at such wealthy institutions that then continue to tout diversity and some of the projects that are brainchilds and acts of love and hours and hours of pouring time by our students. So, you know, during the pandemic, that was, you know, Pitzer students um, making some uh, addresses, as they call it. they made an address to um, the president and the administration about what could be done in the context of Black Lives Matter summer and um, what could be done on the campus in particular. They really wanted the hiring of um, a specific um, uh, Black Studies scholar in a field where um, there wasn't any representation at Pitzer. I hadn't met this professor. They, they were an adjunct um, the previous semester, but I supported the students if that's who they thought really represented them through the experience of having been in a class with them. There are things that the institution could do. So, you know, I give them basically these histories um, and then they're able to use the words that the administration can recognize about how do you hire um, a diversity hire immediately. And then Pomona College students at the same time during the pandemic were trying to create a permanent space for students of African descent on the campus when we return. It's a 24 hour open space that students can go there and just support each other. And that was a struggle. It had been going on for years and years. So it's by the persistence of the students. And I really do think that they should be compensated. If it's something that you all could take up as alumni in some kind of way, that there is a fund. There are all these awards that people get that are not our students, or maybe when they're leaving, they get recognized for something, you know, that doesn't come with money, but like, oh, you did a lot for the community. This is time and labor by working class people. They need to be compensated because they also had to write their papers on top of it for their various classes and do their science experiments and labs. So what I try to do with Africana studies, especially the research centered ones is take those experiences and tell them really you, how to write like a scholar about those experiences, use footnotes on um, the older movement of the 1960s and other movements that have happened and 
So that's my way of like building in a compensation for this invisible work that, you know, us as faculty, us as deans of student affairs for students of color know the countless hours that are uncompensated. And I don't want to teach them that bad lesson by my the sleepy bags under my eyes and all the things that I take on. Instead, I want to tell them things that I wasn't told, which is know your value and demand to be recognized as such. Thank you so much. Um, we have five minutes and there was a question from Elizabeth about uh, CLSA. We would love to have the affinity groups come together with alum. Um, so again, I'm just gonna send you my email and we could talk about uh, what, what we could uh, plan for the fall or spring. And then um, there's another question. Although each of you work and serve in a variety of ways, is there one particular element of your work that gives you the most excitement or satisfaction? I could take this one. I mean, it's it's usually graduation, like having black graduation because of the uniqueness of the event that allows students to give testimony about, you know, who supported them on their path. And um, a lot of them are very honest and transparent about the struggles that they face. A lot of them, um, they use the platform to kind of offer critiques about the institutions and how they made it in spite of the barriers that they experience, And there's no other space to do that really on this campus. So, and especially for black students. So um, with black graduation, seeing the triumphant looks and um, expressions and speeches of these students, um, that usually gives me a lot of satisfaction because for a lot of them, you know, they've been in my office, we've talked, um, some of them are ready to leave, <laughs> might've been ready to leave or, you know, shift gears in terms of, you know, what they were interested in. Um, and a lot of them had to push through and, and under, you know, extraordinary circumstances to get the degree or degrees that they conferred here. Um, so knowing that students have succeeded despite, you know, having, having experienced some barriers and then knowing where they go next and having them come back and talk to me about it um, always gives me a lot of joy. I'm going to say the flip side, I really enjoy meeting the first year students, the first week of classes and letting them know how much we care about them. And to remind them, I remember that first day I met you, I remember you were casting doubt or you were very shy and look how much you've grown. So it's like, I get a great thrill out of welcoming, welcoming our students and making sure they know that we're here for the next four plus years. Um, and, but yes, that the graduation is also a great highlight. It's just, um, I just appreciate the growth that we see between. And for me, I would have to say today was that day, which is their thesis presentations, you know, as faculty, like we nurture them all this time, they're in our classes and just to, we get to see their growth both as scholars and intellectuals, but you know, also as like humans, right? And so um, what they end up kind of putting forward as thesis, um, our, our major, the intercollegiate Chicano studies major, uh, you have to do a thesis. You can also do a thesis project. So that gets really fun and exciting. Um, so that, that's what I enjoy the most um, because it's like the fruits of our labor. And sometimes it's like really returning drafts kind of late at night, <laughs> reading drafts, you know? So that would be for me. I just love um, any follow through that the students have if they're talking about either an activist aim that they're about to um, speak up about, at watching them take it through to its end all the way. And then the student life publishing about, that's our campus newspaper, of course, you know, as alums, um, then capturing that and then me being able to catalog all of these experiences of students, you know, doing the follow through and getting the stuff that they think about um, done. And then I can pass that on to the, you know, the first and second years, especially when they start talking to me about, oh, we really need this. I show them examples of people who have done that. And the same thing uh, on the academic end of you know, they have a passion project and then 
the ones that do it over a couple of years, you know, like they had a seminar research paper with us in Africana studies, but then maybe it also became their senior thesis. Where I see them growing in the papers, I think that's really satisfying. Yes, and uh, Rhonda Foster uh, points out that we were supposed to have a joint um, gathering for alumni last year. So would love to have it in person when it's safe to do so. I think there's a lot of power in this group and solidarity and bridge uh, building. So thank you all. Um, I'm not sure if Bren is gonna close up, but we are at time. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. I just want to close by extending a very special thank you to our panelists, Dean Middleton, Dean Casillas, Professor Portillo, and Professor Solomon, as well as to all of our attendees for joining us this afternoon. Our reunion programming is just kicking off at Pitzer. We have a ton of great events ahead, and several of them are actually open to the 7C community, so please feel free to virtually stop by. With that said, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.